Last time, Demetrius, now King of Macedon, was preparing to unleash a massive campaign into the east in order to reconquer the territories of Antigonus. Finding out about Demetrius' designs on their realms and the colossal force he had assembled, Ptolemy, Lysimachus, and Seleucus hastily renewed their old alliance and prepared their forces. They sent envoys to Pyrrhus, imploring him to join them and open a western front against Demetrius. Pyrrhus was convinced and invaded Macedonia, with Lysimachus attacking from the east, while Ptolemy launched a naval attack on Greece. Demetrius put his son Antigonus in charge of the situation in Greece and marched an army to confront Lysimachus. But when he had heard that Pyrrhus had taken Beroia, which was only slightly more than a day's march from the capital at Pella, he turned to fight the Epirates instead. Demetrius's men, however, were not enthusiastic about their king, especially given many of them had been press-ganged into service, and they greatly admired Pyrrhus for his martial prowess and clement personality. So they began deserting, first a few at a time, then in droves. Eventually some of the soldiers confronted Demetrius and told him to leave, and in doing so save himself, for they were tired of serving him. Demetrius took their advice, disguised himself as a common man, and fled. Pyrrhus entered the Demetrian camp unopposed, and was proclaimed as the new king of Macedon. However, when Lysimachus, coming from the east, encountered Pyrrhus, he disputed Pyrrhus's right to all of Macedonia, as they had both done their fair share in the war. Not immediately wanting another war, Pyrrhus acquiesced, and the kingdom was divided up between the two men, but this peace would prove to be just a temporary one. Demetrius, although he had lost Macedon, was not without his supporters altogether. His wife, though, was not one of them. Despairing of their situation, she drank a fatal poison. Demetrius, still holding on to hope, tried to restore his kingdom from Greece. But, after Athens revolted, and the city could not be subjugated before Pyrrhus arrived to relieve it, he loaded his remaining 11,000 men onto ships, and set sail for Asia. Arriving at Miletus, Demetrius managed to seize a few cities before Agathocles, the son of Lysimachus, arrived with an army and forced Demetrius to flee further into the Anatolian interior. His intention now was to reach the eastern satrapies and incite them into revolt, similar to what Eumenes had done when he had fought Antigonus. However, his army, now only 8,000 strong, was nearly out of supplies and was stricken with disease. He would not be able to make it nearly as far as Media. Therefore he moved south to Tarsus in Calicia, where his soldiers seized what food they could. Demetrius did not wish to provoke Seleucus, but given his circumstances, it seemed he had little choice. So he wrote to the Lord of Asia, and beseeched his former ally to take pity on his misfortune, and furnish his army with supplies. Seleucus was moved by this letter, and was going to provide Demetrius with what he needed, not knowing the ex-king's true designs against Seleucus' kingdom. Presumably, Seleucus thought Demetrius would continue to fight Lysimachus, which would weaken them both. But the old lieutenant of Seleucus, Patrocles, who had fought Demetrius at Babylon years before, warned his king that Demetrius was violent and ambitious, and no man in so desperate a position as he could be trusted to act in a moderate manner. Convinced by this sage counsel, Seleucus instead marched with an army to Calicia. Demetrius, terrified by this, again beseeched Seleucus, begging that he might be allowed to winter in Calicia before leaving abroad to go carve out a petty kingdom for himself among the barbarian tribes. Seleucus agreed, but fortified all the passes from Calicia into Syria, so that Demetrius could not go east. Demetrius tried to move through the Armenian Gate into Syria, which had not yet been so well fortified as the Syrian Gate. Seleucus, predicting Demetrius' movements, sent cavalry on ahead to the pass, and ordered them to set up a multitude of campfires there. Demetrius, on his approach, saw the smoke of these fires and, being fooled into thinking there were more men than there actually were, attempted no passage. Hemmed in by Agathocles to the west and Seleucus to the east, in early 285 BC, Demetrius began pillaging Calicia wholesale, which prompted Seleucus to advance on him. The initial battles favoured Demetrius, and while no decisive engagement was had, Seleucus was certainly on the back foot. When Demetrius had gained the resolve to launch a full field battle against Seleucus, he fell ill once again, losing his opportunity and causing his soldiers to lose heart. 
After he had recovered, he sought to try again, and his army encamped near that of Seleucus. Demetrius, outnumbered, decided to launch a night attack against the Seleucid force. His plan was foiled by the desertion of two young Aetolian Peltasts who went ahead to see Seleucus and warned him of the impending assault. Seleucus sounded the trumpets and roused his men for battle. Demetrius, hearing the trumpets and seeing campfires, saw that the Seleucid army was not sleeping, and so declined his attack and withdrew. From these deserters, Seleucus also learnt just how thoroughly demoralised Demetrius' men were, and pursued them. After some initial skirmishing, Seleucus rode up to a portion of the Demetrian army with only a few of his personal guard. He dismounted, took off his helmet, and called out to the enemy force. He said to them, How long will you be so mad as to follow the fortunes of a bandit who is almost starving when your merits could find their reward with a king who reigns in affluence? You could share with him in a kingdom, not depending on hope, but in actual possession. Demetrius' men threw down their weapons and, cheering, defected to Seleucus, who they hailed as their new king. Demetrius, seeing events repeating themselves once more, attempted to take flight, but could find no open passes which he might escape through. Although he took some convincing from one of his companions, and did briefly consider suicide, eventually Demetrius surrendered himself to Seleucus. Seleucus sent a small party to escort Demetrius to him, led by Apollonides, quite possibly the same Apollonides who had betrayed Eumenes to Antigonus all those years before, because he was an old friend of Demetrius, and Seleucus wanted to make it clear he intended to treat his vanquished foe with friendship. After sending this troop, he appears to have had a change of heart, and sent a thousand men to apprehend Demetrius and take him to a settlement near Antioch, where he would be imprisoned. The former king was kept in a gilded cage. He was assigned servants, given all the food and drink he desired, race courses and hunting parks were provided for his use, and he was allowed regular visitors, including his daughter, Queen Stratonike. Antigonus, the son of Demetrius, who was still defending what holdings were left in Greece, wrote to Seleucus, offering himself and all of Demetrius' lands in exchange for his release. Lysimachus, on the other hand, wrote to Seleucus to remind him of the danger Demetrius posed and offered him 2,000 talents to keep him imprisoned. Seleucus rejected both offers as he had his own plans for Demetrius, wanting to eventually release him and in fact restore him as King of Macedon, albeit as a puppet. He also wanted Antiochus to share in this deed as the benevolence of such an act for his father-in-law would reflect well on him and would serve to bolster his popularity. In Macedon itself, Lysimachus had taken advantage of the capture of Demetrius to secure the rest of the land for himself, defeating Pyrrhus and forcing him to retreat back to Epirus. Thus, the next goal of Seleucus would be to remove Lysimachus and bring Macedonia into his empire, which would bring him closer than anyone yet in the quest to restore the empire of Alexander. In 284 BC, the elderly Ptolemy named his second son, Ptolemy Philadelphus, his heir and co-ruler of Egypt, over his half-brothers, Malega and Ptolemy Coronus. Having seen the writing on the wall, Ptolemy Coronos had in 287 BC already left for Thrace, where resided his sister, Lysandra, the wife of Agathocles. At about this time, a great earthquake struck the region, which almost destroyed the capital city of Lysimachia, which was seen in retrospect as an omen of the events to come. Once the word of Ptolemy Philadelphus's accession reached Thrace, Arsinoe, one of Lysimachus's wives, was promoted in the court to his primary spouse, deposing Agathocles' mother. This was because Arsinoe was the daughter of Queen Berenike of Egypt, and thus the sister of Philadelphus. Coronos and Lysandra, however, were the children of Eurydice, the first wife of Ptolemy, who now, with her children disinherited, had little political clout. Arsinoe took advantage of her new position at Lysimachus' side and began to promote the interests of her own children over the interests of Agathocles and gradually turned the king against his own son, claiming he was conspiring against them. An attempt was made to poison Agathocles, which failed, so Lysimachus simply had him imprisoned, and then executed. 
This was followed by a general purge of all of Agathocles' friends and supporters within the court, of whom there were a great many, as Agathocles was a competent and popular leader. Coronos and Lysandra managed to escape this purge and fled to the court of Seleucus in Syria. This provided a convenient justification for Seleucus to invade Macedonia, as his previous justification, that being the restoration of Demetrius, was now null and void, as the deposed monarch had recently drunk himself to death. At the same time, Ptolemy died in Egypt, of advanced age, leaving only Seleucus and Lysimachus as the remaining companions of Alexander. Now, in 282 BC, Seleucus declared war on Lysimachus, and invaded to depose the supposed tyrant. Immediately the high officers of Lysimachus began to desert to the side of Seleucus, seeing the superior strength of the Lord of Asia, and fearing the tyranny of their own ruler. As Seleucus advanced onto the Anatolian coast, city after city welcomed him, overthrowing their Lysimachean garrisons. Of particular note, Philetaris, the commander of Pergamon, who had been a supporter of Agathocles, turned his city and its substantial treasury over to Seleucus. In return, Seleucus confirmed Philetaris as the ruler of Pergamon. One city, Sardis, housed a royal treasury, and as such was well fortified. Seleucus did not wish to engage in a long siege, so instead he placed a prize of 100 talents for whosoever would kill Theodotus, the commander of the city's garrison. Theodotus, fearful for his life, became paranoid at this, and stopped going out in public. His men, feeling that he did not trust them, became resentful as a result, which only fed Theodotus' paranoia further. Eventually got the better of him, and he himself opened the gates and delivered the city to Seleucus without a battle. In early 281 BC, the armies of the last two Diadochi met at Choripedium, near Sardis, but the exact details of the battle are lost to history. All we know is that Lysimachus was slain by a man called Malachon of Heraclea by way of a javelin, and that Seleucus gained a decisive victory. He credited his triumph to the gods themselves, and gave thanks that he was the last remaining man of his great generation. Lysimachus's body lay on the battlefield, attended only by his loyal dog, until the body was found, either by the thorax who had guarded the body of Antigonus, or by Alexander, one of Lysimachus's sons, and the bones were interred in a temple thereafter called the Lysimacheum. Seleucus briefly organised his new conquests in Asia Minor, founding cities such as the Pisidian Antioch, and tasking one Aphrodisius with organising the administration of the new provinces. Now Seleucus was to finally return home to Macedonia, after being away for more than five decades. The Didymean Oracle had advised him to remain in Asia so long ago, and so he had for so long. It is said, however, that another time he had consulted an oracle on the topic of his own death. Seleucus was told that he would die before his time if he ever approached Argos. Argos, most famously, was a city in the Peloponnese, but there existed several other cities by that name, all of which Seleucus dutifully avoided all his life. But on the advance to Lysimachia, he came across an altar. This altar had been founded in aeons past by the Argonauts, so the people called it Argos, after the ship. Seleucus, not being aware of the name, attended this altar to pay his respects. There he was cut down from behind by Ptolemy Coronis, who, despite having been treated with honour, was embittered at having not been given a kingdom of his own to rule. Coronis then mounted his horse and raced to Lysimachia, where he had himself crowned the new king of Macedon. Philetaris, the prince of Pergamon, ransomed the body of Seleucus from Coronis, had it cremated, and then sent it to Seleucia Pieria, where the king would find his final resting place. In his seven decades, Seleucus had accomplished an astonishing amount. In his youth, he had marched across Persia with Alexander. He would survived the political and military struggles immediately after Alexander's death, and he would won battle after battle often against significant odds, and founded city after city, creating a great empire out of very little. His military accomplishments, often achieved using quite unconventional tactics, were all the more impressive given the foes he was fighting were also battle-hardened and experienced generals, leading veteran Macedonian troops. Unlike Alexander, who had a superior military system to his opponents, 
Sir Lucas and his foes were essentially on a level playing field, so he can attribute the bulk of his many victories to his own skilled generalship. Politically, he was astute, and knew when to take action, and when to do nothing. At points, he kept his head down, and allowed his rivals to destroy each other, while at other times he engaged in rapid action to secure his political position. He was also not afraid of getting his hands dirty and engaging in some quite ruthless political machinations when it was necessary to improve his situation, whether that be the assassination of Perdiccas or the imprisonment of his own father-in-law. Due to his shrewdness, he was able to rise from having nothing to forming a mighty kingdom. On a personal level, he was well respected by his contemporaries for his competence and for his personal bravery. His personal presence and charisma was inspiring for his own men, and in a number of cases, caused his enemies to open their gates to him and defect to his side. His own subjects, on the other hand, were fiercely loyal to him, even in the face of enemy occupation. The empire he established would last far after his own life, and the cities he established would, in many cases, remain significant places for centuries and even millennia, with some of those cities remaining major settlements to this day. Antioch in Syria, in particular, would become incredibly strategically important and would be one of the chief cities of the Eastern Mediterranean up until its destruction in the late medieval period. Seleucus was the last of the Diadochi, and of all of them, he had come the closest to reuniting the empire under one ruler. Had his life not been cut short, perhaps this dream would have been fulfilled. He would be remembered by history as Seleucus Nicator, the Victorious. Now the crown passed to his son, Antiochus, and it will remain to be seen whether he, or indeed any of his successors, can live up to the legacy of King Seleucus I. Next time, the newly crowned Antiochus will be faced with a slew of challenges, with the most dire coming the form of a new enemy, the Gauls. If you have any comments, criticism, or questions, please post them below, and thank you for listening.